We want to know the location of the centroid. Uh, I also note here, we're not in equilibrium. We're not dealing with free body diagrams. We're not dealing with equilibrium equations. This part is really just pure math that we're working with. So we'll find the centroid of this shape. So the first decision we have to make to find this centroid is, are we going to be solving this using vertical strips, or are we going to use horizontal strips? So if we go back and look at what was the difference between the two, would we rather express everything in terms of x and dx, or would we rather express everything in terms of y and dy? And that will determine, are we using vertical orientation or a horizontal orientation? And for that, what we want to do is look at what is the, that bounding function that we have here. Here we have y equals 1 9th x cubed. So really the choice is do we want to express y in terms of x or do we want to express x in terms of y? Right, so the, kind of the rule of thumb is if we can avoid using a radical, we should. So at some point we're going to have either y isolated or x isolated. The way this is given to us, y is already isolated here. So we would rather express y in terms of x, because otherwise we're going to have a cube root of y. And to integrate that, it's not really too difficult. Um, but this is much easier to integrate a polynomial than it is a radical. So this, cl this clues me in that I would rather have everything expressed in terms of x. So I would like the first choice, express everything in x and dx, which means I want to make, I would prefer to make vertical strips to solve this problem. And we'll see what, where that pays off in a second here. So I'll just kind of draw one generic strip, and this is going to be representative of every strip I can draw. The idea here is that I have a strip over here, a strip here, and I keep going until I have my final strip over here. I can find the area of each strip, I'm going to add them together, and that gives me the area of my entire shape. Because I'm using an infinite number of these strips, I can get away with it. When I draw it big here, obviously it's not exactly precise. But remember, each one of these is infinitely thin. And each one is going to have a width of dx. Right, so vertical strips are going to be easier to work with here. So what I need to find is what is the area of any strip that I have. And that's going to be its height times its width. The width of every strip is going to be dx. So I have to determine what is the height of every strip I have uh, from the leftmost strip to the rightmost strip. And what I can do, depending if I have a horizontal or a vertical orientation, if I, can, if I know what, where the bottom of any strip is located, if I know where the top of any strip is located, then the difference between the two will give me that height. So for this particular problem, where is the bottom of every strip located? Right, they're all at y equals zero. So that's easier, they all share that. That's not always the case, but in this case it is. But then you see that this is, not, this is shorter than this one, shorter than this one, shorter than this one. So their heights are going to vary. So I can say that the lower value of y is equal to 0. And then what's the upper value of y going to be? Right. It's equal to this binding function, the 1 9th x squared. And what I want to do is I want to express both of these in terms of x. This is just 0, so that's OK. But every one has a height of 1 9th x cubed. That's true for this one. That's true for this one. It's true for all of them. So generally, it's going to be y upper minus y lower is going to be the height times dx. So in this case, my dA, because this is 0, it'll be 1 9th x cubed times dx. So I have my dA, the area of, every of any one strip. So the first thing I can do is find what's the total area of this shape from, x, from my left end to my right end. So to find the area, I just integrate dA. In this case, I'm looking at 
vertical strips, which means I have to see where does the leftmost strip start here when x is equal to 0. And then I'm adding rectangles, adding rectangles. Once I hit x equals 3, that's my last rectangle. So that's going to be the upper bound of this integral. And I think it's useful to put this x equals 3 versus y, because otherwise you might be thinking, you might do this in terms of y, but then have everything here in terms of x. And in this case, it would actually be OK, because y goes from 0 to 3, and x equals 0 to 3. But that's not always the case. So my leftmost rectangle is at 0. My rightmost one is when x is 3. dA, I defined above. I can pull this 1 ninth out. I have an x cubed on the inside. I have a dx on the inside. Uh, for this integral, it's a polynomial. And you see, this is where it pays off. This is easy to find the antiderivative of. The cube root, it's more of a hassle to find the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of x cubed is going to be 1 fourth x to the fourth power. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 3. So I can pull that 1 quarter out from uh, these brackets here. So I evaluate x at 3, and I subtract it, evaluated at 0. So I'm going to have 3 raised to the fourth minus 0 raised to the fourth, which is just going to be 0. I can evaluate all this, and I can find that the total area under this shape is going to be, if I can find it, 9 over 4, or 2.25 feet squared. The next step is, once I have my area, I'll just write it up there. Now I want to go about finding the centroid in the x and the centroid in the y. What I need to define, then, is where, for any one rectangle, is its x centroid located with respect to the origin and its y centroid located with respect to the origin. This will be my y tilde. And then that will be my x tilde. So again, the tilde means for an individual rectangle, its centroid. And then the bar means for the whole shape, where is its centroid. So let's start by defining x tilde. And if we use vertical or horizontal strips, one of them is always easy to find. And the other one is not necessarily hard. It's just some, a little bit more work. So for any infinitely thin rectangle, where is its, what is the value of its x tilde going to be? So how far is its centroid from the y-axis? Let's just say this is at x equals 2. So how far is its centroid from the y-axis? Right. And if it's at x equals 3, the same thing is true. If it's at x equals 1, that's, always, that's also true. So for vertically oriented rectangles, the x tilde is always just x. For horizontally oriented rectangles, the y tilde is always y. And we'll see that in coming examples. The y tilde, though, is not going to be just a, as simple a value, because we see here it's only this far from the x-axis, and that's this far from the x-axis. And then for the tall triangle, my y tilde is this far from the x-axis. So the y tilde is changing. And it's not simply equal to y the same way the x tilde was just equal to x. So for any trying, uh, rectangle I have, what is its value for y tilde going to be? 1 18th x cubed. Right, 1 18th x cubed. More generally, how would we find it? It's just the average of the upper and the lower. So we can say it's 1 half of U L U y u plus y l. In this case, because the lower is 0, it does turn out that that's just going to be 1 half times uh, the upper. So we do get the 1 18th x cubed. But in general, if the bottom is not just always at 0 or always at a constant value, then it's just the average of those two values, which was also true here. So we have our x tilde defined, and we have our y tilde defined for any rectangle that we have. Questions on getting my x tilde, y tilde for this one. 
Right? Now we can go and find x bar. Right? So our x bar was defined on the previous page or the previous slides. I'm going to integrate along those same bounds 0 to 3 my x tilde times dA. And I'll divide that by the area, which I found in that previous step. So the denominator is already done. I know it's 2.25. So it's that numerator that I have to figure out using another integration. So I'll just look at the integral for right now. I want to integrate from 0 to 3 x tilde, which is x, times dA, which is defined here. So I take dA, I multiply it by x, so I get 1 ninth x to the fourth dx. If I take its antiderivative, I get 1 fifth x to the fifth, evaluated from 0 to 3. And then as a number, I get that that numerator is going to be equal to 5.4, uh, and that's actually in feet cubed for the, for the numerator. So again, the numerator is 5.4. In the previous step, I found the denominator A was 2.25. So I can find that x bar will be 5.4 divided by 2.25. So x bar is 2.4 feet. So if I go to the origin, and I go to the right by 2.4 feet, that is going to be, I'll kind of draw it to scale here. Right around here, this is approximately, well, I'll just say it's about there. Now I want to find the y location as my last step. It's really the same process then to find y bar. All the changes is we're going to multiply y tilde times dA instead. Okay, so y tilde, we said, was 1 18th x cubed. dA was 1 9th x cubed. So those two quantities, I want to multiply together. So I can actually pull out the 1 18th. I can pull out the 1 9th. So on the inside, I'm left with x cubed times x cubed is x to the sixth times dx. I can take this antiderivative. I'll pull out that 1 seventh. So the 18th goes through. The 1 ninth comes through. From the antiderivative, I get a 1 seventh that I pulled out. And then I can evaluate x to the seventh from 0 to 3. So if I evaluate this expression now for x from 0 to 3, I get that numerator is 1.93. The denominator, again, I still have. It's still that 2.25. So the last step is I can find y bar by dividing by 1.93 by my 2.25. And I get that y bar is 0.857 feet. So back to my figure here, if I wanted to at least estimate from this picture, I would have to go 2.4 to the right. I would have to go up by 0.857. So actually, it's probably somewhere around here. 